And welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. I'm Andrew Kraft, 645 here on the West Coast, 945 there on the East Coast. Uh, and we have some breaking news uh, to bring you coming from the Department of Justice with regard to Hamas and its military leader, Yahya Sinwar. Um, well, this is what we know, according to the Associated Press. The Justice Department announced criminal charges today against Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar and other militants in connection with the October 7th 2023 rampage inside of Israel that killed more than 1,200 Israelis and, of course, more than 250 of them were taken captive. Now, the criminal complaint was filed in federal court in New York City. It includes charges of conspiring to provide material support to a foreign terrorist organization resulting in death. Uh, now, Sinwar, of course, was appointed the overall head of Hamas after the killing of Ismail Haniya in Iran. He sits atop Israel's most wanted list. He's believed to have spent most of the past 10 months living in tunnels under Gaza, and it's unclear how much contact he has had with the outside world. Now, I'll stop talking because we do have an announcement on these very charges uh, from Attorney General Merrick Garland today. Let's watch. Today, the Justice Department unsealed charges against Yahya Sinwar and other senior leaders of Hamas for financing and directing a decades-long campaign to murder American citizens and endanger the security of the United States. As outlined in our complaint, those defendants, armed with weapons, political support, and funding from the government of Iran and support from Hezbollah, have led Hamas's efforts to destroy the state of Israel and murder civilians in support of that aim. In its attacks over the past three decades, Hamas has murdered or injured thousands of civilians, including dozens of American citizens. In the early morning hours of October 7th of last year, Hamas, led by these defendants, committed its most violent, large-scale terrorist attack to date. During the attack, Hamas terrorists murdered civilians who tried to flee and those who sought refuge in bomb shelters. They murdered entire families. They murdered the elderly, and they murdered young children. They weaponized sexual violence against women. On October 7th, Hamas terrorists murdered nearly 1,200 people, including over 40 Americans, and kidnapped hundreds of civilians. They perpetrated the deadliest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. This weekend, we learned that Hamas murdered six more hostages, including Hirsch Goldberg Poland, a 23-year-old Israeli American. We are investigating Hirsch's murder and each and every one of the brutal murders of Americans as acts of terrorism. We will continue to support the whole of government effort to bring the Americans still being held hostage home. The charges unsealed today are just one part of our effort to target every aspect of Hamas's operations. These actions will not be our last. The Justice Department has a long memory. We will pursue the terrorists responsible for murdering Americans and those who illegally provide them with material support for the rest of their lives. All right, Attorney General Merrick Garland there uh, with the announcement uh, of these criminal charges. Let's talk about them even further with none other than Hal Kempfer, national security analyst and expert and retired Marine intelligence officer. He joins me. Um, Hal, thanks for being with us here. Uh, I guess my first question to you is this. What does the DOJ hope to achieve by this? Are they trying to enact financial costs on how Hamas does business here? Or is this somewhat symbolic since we are nearing the one-year anniversary since October 7th? Where do you see this? Well, Andrew, you can't, you can't ignore the symbolism of it, uh, which is to uh, do this. Of course, right after uh, the horrific uh, execution, if you will, of six hostages to include uh, an Israeli-American uh, that was killed in that. So I think that's part of it. Although this thing's been coming along for quite some time. Uh, Hania, the uh, assassinated head of Hamas, uh, the, or the, you know, who was killed in, in Tehran, he's actually indicted. Obviously, that's a little bit overcome by events, but it gives you an idea of how long it's taken to get to this point. They've been going through all the procedural hurdles to do this. What this does over time, though, is it re really restricts the ability of these officials, uh, you know, looking forward 
to move around the world. If they go someplace where we can extradite them, and that's a lot of different countries, uh, we will. And that's the idea is that whatever comes out of this, if they were to flee and move to other countries around the world, there would be very few countries they could go to. And that would be the restriction, if you will, that's upon this. It also opens up, of course, you mentioned uh, some of the civil things that can be done. And when you include Iran and Hezbollah in that discussion, uh, I can tell you if I was uh, analyzing this from a uh, asset forfeiture or civil uh, civil investigation standpoint, it would be uh, I would see a lot of opportunities to uh, relieve them of their assets and funds at every opportunity. You know, um, we had Rabbi Rick Jacobs on on Monday night, uh, and you know, I thought that the Biden and Harris statements over the weekend uh, about the murder of these six hostages, one of whom was an Israeli American, Hirsch Goldberg, Poland. I thought those statements were very, very strong. But I asked Rabbi Jacobs. When will the words translate into action? Is this the action today, this? Well, it's not a lot of action. It's uh, what action we could do on the legal standpoint. Uh, okay. Realistically, the most the, the most action that's going to have an impact, certainly on Yahya Sinwar, would be something of a more kinetic uh, basis. Uh, there's limitations on what we can do with that, and certainly the politics don't allow us to do a whole lot. This certainly is not last October or November. As uh, you recall, there was some discussion back then could the u.s go in and try to say you know do an independent mission right. to try and get its own uh certainly the, that situation is is not there uh israel controls the ground but they don't control the subterranean and uh so there are limitations to what the u.s can really do okay. other than putting pressure on iran and hezbollah so, Hal, the Wall Street Journal has a piece today you sent it over to me it goes as follows that palestinian militant group hamas suggested mm -hmm. it would execute Israeli hostages if Israel's military attempted further rescue missions as both sides double down on demands to end the war. Um, Hamas is making that threat. Uh, they made it over the weekend saying that if there are any more IDF special missions to rescue hostages, either dead or alive, well, they will intervene. Uh, and so where do you see this as far as Hamas is concerned. Is this Hamas trying to gain leverage they have lost? Does Hamas even have any leverage anymore here? If Hamas is going to kill living hostages when the IDF is hours away from rescuing them, what more leverage do they have? Uh, are they trying to regain it as the ceasefire negotiations continue? You're, you're bringing up a, a great question, which is what does Hamas expect to gain from this? Right. Uh, certainly, uh, there was some thought that, well, this would really restrict uh, what Israel can do. And of course, they're trying to work the information operations in order to, and, and to some, some degree, in all fairness, they're having some success. If you look at the protests going on in Israel, uh, you can see that they're definitely having an impact on the body politic of Israel. The reality, though, is it's really hardening the hardliners, if you will. Uh, and they look at this, and, and there is a... Uh, a moral threshold that they passed here, which okay. is, uh, which President Biden has talked about, which is here they are, you know, executing hostages, innocent hostages that are being held, and uh, and when you when you go to that length, when you start to do things like that, it really makes it difficult to negotiate with them, and in some ways, ironically, it has somewhat strengthened Netanyahu's hand in taking this sort of hard stance that he's taken, okay. at least amongst. Uh, uh, probably about half the body politic in Israel. They would okay. probably line up behind him and say, hey, look, just stay stay the course and uh, and, and ignore the, the impact of the protests. So, Hal, let's talk about uh, the ceasefire negotiations as they stand, um, because there seem to be uh, some sticking points um, that are, you know, quite intransigent to both sides here. Uh, and it doesn't seem like much budging is going on, no matter how many times... President Biden says, we're close. He says it many, many times, and he has said it many times, you know, since last year here. Why does he keep saying it? If they haven't gotten a deal yet since the one that was struck over the Thanksgiving holiday last year for a hostage release, every time he is asked about it, and I mean every time he says we're close, are they really close? And if they're not close at all, what are the sticking points now? Oh, the sticking points are pretty big. You know, the the uh, Philadelphia corridor, that uh, that area that borders 
uh, the Gaza Strip and uh, and Egypt, and and that's not a new thing. I mean, that goes back. Well, as long as there's been a Gaza Strip, it goes back. But uh, it certainly was a it was a big part of the 2005-2006 negotiations. You know, the Egyptians, and there was supposed to be like a UN force that was in there to keep that from being used as a uh, smuggling corridor for weapons and arms. Well, that kind of fell apart when uh, when Hamas took over in 2007. What they have done is they've gone in there, and and all the reports coming out is it's much more honeycombed with uh, smuggling tunnels than they than they ever realized. Okay. And so part of that is a, is is this fear that uh, that they'll be used for smuggling again, and that's the only really the only lifeline that keeps Hamas going militarily is to get arms through that corridor. So he's taking a hard stance. With that said, though. Um, if you if you listen to the military side, to his own defense minister, they're saying, "Hey, look, we don't have to take a hard stance. We can we can pull our forces out, and if we got to go back in six weeks later, we can go back in." That is the biggest sticking point. That one corridor is the biggest issue. Um, and Bibi Netanyahu is not budging on the Philadelphia corridor, is he? No, oh, not at all. He's actually uh, entrenched, if anything, right now. Uh, it's not quite sure what would make him move on that, although. Uh, it was interesting to hear some of the public statements from former prime ministers who are basically saying, "Hey, look, we can do this. We can, we can, we can pull our forces out, and we can go back in if needed." Which is true. Uh, it is very true. But that hardline coalition that makes up his cabinet, and and it is an extreme hardline coalition, doesn't want him to concede anything. Okay. And they are dug in on this as well. But it does seem like everyday residents of Tel Aviv who have taken the streets since the weekend, they want Netanyahu to concede something, to, to budge a little. Don't you get that sense? I get the sense uh, in a major way. In fact, what everybody's saying is, look, you got to do something because if you don't, they're going to execute more hostages. So, you know, make the concession now, pull out, get at least, you know, as, as, as one prominent uh, a former prime minister said, look, at least get the 30 hostages out that we can alive. Uh, and, and if they got to go back in, they got to go back in. But it's trying to save lives. And, the, and this, uh, this recognition that uh, all the hostages are in the same situation, if you will, that the six who were recently executed are in. And the, and the fear is that any further attempts at rescue or any further attempts at military operations to try and find them will end up with the same sort of, you know, horrible results. So that's what you see on the streets. That's this this body politic. And these these protests are massive, but it's these they do not represent his coalition. They I do see. not represent uh, who he represents in the Knesset. And it is the farthest right coalition, uh, I think, ever in Israeli history. So let's go back to the Philadelphia Corridor. Uh, it is this demarcation point where, and correct me if I'm wrong, between the border of Egypt and Gaza. Uh, yes. And from what I understand, Israeli officials believe there are tunnels underneath it, and that is how Hamas ferries in weapons and supplies, what have you. So to me, that seems that Hamas is so concerned with Israel controlling that very, very small stretch of land because it is their key survival route to the outside world. And it, it goes to the fact that the Hamas tunnel system is their lifeblood. If they don't have that, if they can't supply and support that, um, their existence is in jeopardy. I, I'm trying to get in the mindset uh, of a Hamas terror fighter. I don't want to, but I'm trying, and it's very hard. Is that what they're thinking, that this is a crucial, grave threat to their very existence? Andrew, uh, negotiators would say you're, they're somewhat of an impasse. For Hamas, they see losing the control of this corridor, losing all those tunnels. And it's not just what Israel believes, it's what they found. They found this thing was far more honeycombed with tunnels. It was like, uh, I think the term Swiss cheese came up uh, when they were talking about the subterranean situation there uh, than they ever had known before. And they realized just how pervasive it was and, and they were discovering, they're still discovering tunnels all okay. the time. All right. So for Hamas, yes, if they lose that tunnel system, everything else is controlled by Israel. And they even control the waterway. I mean, you can't, they can't bring anything over water or underwater either. Okay. So that is their lifeline. I and see. if they lose that, for them, it's, a, it's an existential 
sort of concession. All right. Uh, Hal Kuyper, we're going to have to leave it at that. Uh, we do appreciate always uh, your time and your insight. We'll talk soon, Hal. Thanks.